Well, good afternoon, good morning, good evening, everyone, depending where you are. Welcome to today's Future of Financial Information webinar. Uh, so it's my great pleasure to welcome Pablo Tonello from the University of Michigan, who will present his uh, paper on the role of financial intermediaries in uh, stock markets. So that's one of the hottest trends in uh, asset pricing to explore the, the role of these uh, institutions which channel the capital from investors to, to companies. And uh, so Pablo has a, some new uh, intriguing empirical results and uh, a new identification strategy to, to shed light on this role. Uh, so um, on the agenda, we also have uh, Marco Groteria from London Business School to, to give a discussion. As far as I can see, Marco is not uh, yet here. He, uh, he emailed me with, uh, saying he has some connection issues. So fingers crossed that these can be uh, solved in the next 30 minutes while, while Pablo is presenting. Uh, and um, after that, the, the plan is to have a 15 minute discussion by Marco and to spend the rest of the time with questions from the audience. Um, but if you have a question, you don't need to uh, sit on it until the Q&A parts. Uh, feel free to put it in the chat. Uh, so I will be monitoring the chat and um, Pablo's co-author, uh, Seng Ting Wong, is also uh, with us today. So some chances are you might get an answer from her directly. Otherwise, uh, we will go back to, to each question at the end. And so now, without further ado, um, Pablo, please, the screen is yours for 30 minutes. Thank you very much, uh, Michel, for the invitation. Uh, it's a great pleasure to be here. Uh, and uh, thanks to all of you for, for joining. Um, do you see my slides uh, well? All right, so this uh, paper is called Financial Intermediaries in the Macroeconomy, Evidence from a High Frequency Identification in his joint work uh, with Wen Ting Song, who is uh, also here. So our goal in this paper is to study what is the effect of uh, financial intermediaries in the macroeconomy. This question, which has been um, uh, important in macroeconomics, at least in, since the Great Depression, has attracted significant attention from researchers over the last uh, several decades. Now, the empirical challenge of uh, studying the role of uh, financial intermediaries in the aggregate economy is that events that take place outside of uh, financial intermediaries affect their net worth, uh, making it hard to isolate the effect of intermediaries in, in the rest of the aggregate economy. Okay, so in this paper, we propose a high frequency identification strategy to study the effects of intermediaries in the aggregate economy. Okay, the, the key idea of the paper is to focus on changes of financial intermediaries net worth on a narrow window uh, around their uh, earnings announcements um, and uh, exploiting the fact that earnings announcements are lumpy and uh, present a discontinuity on the information content of financial news around these events. Okay, so the spirit of our exercise is akin to that of the high frequency identification in the monetary uh, policy literature that has been very fruitful for empirical analysis. Okay, so uh, to provide a summary of what we do, we begin by constructing a high frequency measure of financial shocks in the US economy. Uh, we do so by using uh, tick by tick data on stock prices in a narrow window around the earnings announcements. And we exploit uh, the size of publicly traded financial intermediaries where, that can have, uh, therefore, because of their size, an effect on the aggregate economy. Okay, then in the second part of the paper, we study the effects of changes of financial intermediaries, net worth, and non financial firms. We do so by using two alternative strategies, our baseline mis and event study approach. Uh, alternatively, we use an heteroscasticity based uh, identification strategy. From our empirical analysis, we find that a 1% decline in the uh, net worth of uh, financial intermediaries in our sample uh, leads to a 0.2 to 0.4% decline in uh, the market value of non financial firms. Okay, and then finally, we study the transmission channel of these financial shocks. We study the role of aggregate net worth and the firm's financial positions, and we find stronger effects for risky and illiquid firms 
and when financial the, when the financial system is uh, undercapitalized, both of which have been uh, important uh, features highlighted in the literature of financial intermediaries in the macro economy. Okay, now um, just a few words on the literature to put our paper into perspective. Uh, we are uh, building on the large literature that has studied the cross-sectional exposure of intermediaries uh, uh, in terms of firms and, and asset prices. Uh, our main contribution here is to analyze these uh, aggregate effects. Uh, and uh, by doing so, we are connected to a literature that has analyzed the aggregate effects through time series method, combination of uh, cross-sectional uh, and, and, and regional data, or a model-based inference of uh, financial shocks. Okay, so the plan is to start with our measure of financial shocks, I'll then go to the effects of financial intermediaries and finally discuss the transmission mechanism. Okay, so um, in terms of sample and data, we focus on commercial investment uh, and security dealers listed on the S&P 500. Um, and we uh, measure their earnings announcement dates and times from the institutional broker's uh, estimate uh, system. All right, then we use uh, tick level stock price data uh, from the New York Stock Exchange uh, trade and quote that we have access for the period 98 to 2014. Uh, and from this, we obtain uh, intraday trades 10 stamp to the second from the S&P 500 uh, constituent securities. Okay, we also analyze effects on daily stocks and bond indices that are gathered uh, from Bloomberg uh, and, and, and we analyze here a variety of, of securities. Okay, now how do we measure financial shocks? Well, uh, we consider a narrow window around the earning announcements of these intermediaries uh, and we measure the uh, change in the log price of uh, the mar in the market value of the releasing institution in, a, in that narrow window weighted by uh, the um, net worth of the releasing intermediary in the uh, uh, total net worth uh, of our sample. Okay, so this figure uh, illustrates uh, our methodology. So for example, this is uh, JP Morgan in 1999. Uh, the mark line here dates the earning release. Well, we, what we analyze is how much the uh, market value of JP Morgan changes in this narrow window around uh, JP Morgan's uh, announcement. Okay, and this is what we are going to be considering as uh, the financial shock. In terms of descriptives, we uh, show that uh, we, we, we obtain sizable uh, changes in the individual uh, stock prices. After we weigh them, we uh, obtain a median positive and, and negative shocks of uh, around 0.06 to 0.08. Um, and um, we, we characterize the properties of these shocks, highlighting that they are uh, unpredictable in terms of the um, uh, uh, macroeconomic conditions that occur um, before the earnings releases, for example, using uh, machine learning techniques. We also conduct uh, textual based analysis uh, showing that uh, these shocks reflect intermediary idiosyncratic factors uh, and that they are correlated with their surprise earnings. And we also show that these uh, shocks are granular in terms of that they have a, a sizable effect on the overall uh, market value of uh, uh, intermediaries uh, and that therefore we can use them to analyze the effects on the macro economy. Okay, the second part of our paper precisely analyze their effects on the uh, macro economy. And I wanna kind of consider um, uh, a canonical framework to provide um, some theoretical guideline to, to, to what we're trying to, to analyze. Okay, so consider an economy uh, populated by households, firms, uh, and intermediaries. Um, uh, for simplicity, for, consider, for example, a two-period economy in which households are risk neutral and firms have access to an isoelastic technology. And then these firms uh, uh, finance their investment uh, from funds that intermediaries obtain uh, from the households. And uh, these uh, funds are either in the forms of deposit or costly equity issuance. Okay, now consider that there are some uh, aggregate or idiosyncratic factors that can uh, shift the initial aggregate net worth uh, of financial intermediaries. Now, what we are going to try to be thinking of is how do, does the economy move when there is a change precisely to one of these uh, idiosyncratic factors of intermediaries that affects their initial net worth available uh, for investment. Okay, now uh, in this economy that I'm showing you, there is a representation which is fairly classic in terms of uh, an upward sloping supply of funds and a downward sloping uh, demand of funds. So the demand of funds here is uh, that coming from the uh, optimal choice 
uh, of capital from firms taking as given uh, the price of their debts, whose inverse is the interest rate, um, uh, and is downward sloping because of decreasing returns. The uh, aggregate supply of funds is upward sloping here uh, because for intermediaries, it is costly to raise external finance. So um, to provide additional funds, these intermediaries are going to require a higher return, which is uh, coming from higher uh, interest rates at which they lend to firms. Okay, the equilibrium is determined in the overall level of capital that these uh, non-financial firms choose and uh, the interest rates at which intermediaries lend to these firms. Okay, now considering this environment, a shift uh, to the initial net worth that these intermediaries have, which comes from these um, idiosyncratic factors that we uh, label here omega, well, the granularity assumption is that intermediaries this set are large enough to have a, 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 an effect on the overall net worth uh, of the economy. And what you will have if there is, for example, a decline in the net worth, uh, in the initial net worth of intermediaries, is that um, uh, in order for providing the same amount of funding, intermediaries will require uh, a higher um, uh, interest rate, which implies a shift uh, of the supply of funds curve. And overall, the equilibrium will be uh, uh, implied uh, a lower investment and a higher uh, interest rate. Okay, that's kind of a, a classic, if you want, effect of uh, the supply um, uh, uh, shocks affecting the supply of funds through the net worth of intermediaries. Now, you can think about um, that the effects of these um, shocks will be governed by the degree of financial frictions that intermediaries face. In our framework, the degree of, inter of frictions that intermediaries face is governed by how costly it is for them to raise external funds. Here we're doing it, for example, with equity financing. Uh, we, we can think about uh, parametrizing those costs of equity financing. And the larger are the costs for intermediaries to recapitalize, the larger these effects of a change in the uh, aggregate net worth is. In the limit in which um, these uh, intermediaries do not face any cost of raising uh, uh, external finance, we will recover uh, a, a neoclassical Modigliani Miller's type of result in which changes in the net worth of the intermediaries do not have any effect uh, on the, uh, the rest of the macroeconomy, uh, precisely because uh, intermediaries can recapitalize and, and, and any shock that they have, they can offset it by raising new external funds. The higher um, the cost of external finance from these intermediaries, the steeper becomes the aggregate supply of funds, and therefore the, the larger are the effects for a given value in their initial net worth on the overall uh, uh, interest rates and on the overall capital, because uh, for any dollar that intermediaries lose in terms of net worth is more costly for intermediaries to recapitalize, so they require a larger increase in interest rates in order to be willing to bring the same amount of external funds. Okay, this is a theoretical framework that we can bring, so you can think about the uh, test that we're doing about what is the effect of financial shocks on the macroeconomy uh, as informing about the degrees of financial frictions that intermediaries face, uh, informing both the amplification that models of financial frictions are going to have and of uh, uh, financial shocks as a propagation mechanism. Okay, so that's kind of a, uh, the framework that, that we're providing for our empirical analysis. Okay, so now back to the data. We consider uh, our baseline results consider an event time uh, type of analysis in which we analyze in a narrow window around intermediaries uh, release of earnings, uh, the uh, change in the log of uh, stock price a firm in the non-financial firm in the S&P 500, in that narrow window. This is our left-hand side here, variable. And here, this epsilon is our measure of financial shocks, as I described to you before, uh, the uh, change in the market value of releasing uh, financial uh, intermediaries weighted by uh, what is their net worth in the total share of this. The beta here will be informing the elasticity of non-financial first market value to financial shocks, which is the object of interest that I was showing you to you uh, in the model. And this is subject that is going to be influenced by the degree of financial frictions at intermediary size. The identifying assumption of our baseline event time study analysis is that in a narrow window, intermediary prices are driven by release informations that is specific to them by this omega in the model and not uh, from something outside of the financial sector, which was Z, for example, this total factor product. Okay, here, this uh, table shows uh, precisely our coefficient of interest is beta for uh, different uh, specifications. Um, the uh, columns here show uh, if we only use 
as a financial shock the releasing intermediaries, we obtain a 0.3 of coefficient. Uh, if we use instead the whole set of financial intermediaries in that narrow window, uh, exchanging their net worth, we obtain a coefficient around 0.2, which indicates that a 1% decline of the market in the market value of financial intermediaries in our sample is associated with a 0.2% decline in the market value of non-financial firms in that narrow window. Okay, now, of course, you, you can say, well, to what extent does our uh, uh, baseline uh, uh, identifying assumption holds? For example, even in a narrow window, we could have non-financial factors affecting potentially the market value of non-financial and financial firms. So we address that potential, confirm, uh, that potential concern with an alternative identification strategy based on an heteroscale CCD-based uh, approach. What is the idea here? Is to consider a bivariate system uh, from the value of non-financial and, and financial uh, firms uh, and to allow that potentially there are common factors uh, affecting these uh, type of firms even in that narrow window. Now the identifying assumption of this CCD based approach is that the variance of intermediary stock prices in event dates is uh, larger than in non-event dates but for non-financial firms the variance uh, is the same both in non-event and in event states. Okay, so if you want, you can see there's a milder assumption to add of our baseline uh, identification. Now, what do we consider as events? We consider uh, releasing of intermediaries, uh, and, and what we consider as non-event dates is uh, the releasing of earnings of non-financial firms. Okay, so it's not that we're comparing earning announcement to you know plain vanilla uh, non-announcement uh, dates. So we also uh, put uh, as non-event dates uh, moments that are uh, have an important component of releasing information, but we use the uh, information of non-financial firms. Okay, now this table uh, compares the heteroscale CCD base to our baseline, our event study approach with all uh, intermediaries, and we obtain something a larger uh, coefficient uh, around a point of 36, which indicates that a 1% decline in uh, the market value of non-financial firms uh, is associated with uh, a decline uh, of financial firms associated with a decline of uh, the market the market value of non-financial firms of around 0.36. All right. Okay. Then we analyze that our results uh, are robust to several uh, specifications. So we do, if you want, an, an exhaustive analysis of, of alternative uh, ways of interpreting and, and you know, additional analysis that are reassuring about the results. We uh, use, for example, alternative uh, weighting schemes. Um, uh, for the um, financial intermediaries finding uh, similar approaches. We also use um, a, a broader set of financial shocks that do not take into account only releasing of earnings that occur in uh, trading hours, but they're also take into account uh, earnings that are, occur uh, after hours and find uh, also consistent results. We cluster, for example, uh, when there are several uh, releases of earnings uh, in, in the same uh, day. Uh, we um, uh, analyze that our results are, are robust to several uh, type of financial intermediaries, so they are not driven by a sp specific type uh, of intermediaries. We also analyze the effects on uh, additional equity indices, such as small cap stocks or, or the Russell. Uh, and we show that our results are robust to a uh, granular instrumental variable uh, 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 strategy. All right, we also do a set of uh, placebo tests, uh, for example, by shifting. Um, uh, the day to uh, event dates. Um, we also conduct uh, similar analysis for firms that are non-financial and that are included, for example, in the, in the Dow Jones uh, and find uh, consistent results uh, with our baseline. Um, uh, and um, uh, we show that they are, um, if you analyze non-financial firms, you do not recover the uh, main results of our financial firms. So there is something specific about our financial firms uh, driving uh, our results. All right. Okay. We also uh, consider if you think about the model in which I was showing to you, the effects were coming uh, through changes in interest rates. So we test uh, the effect that these financial shocks have uh, on uh, bond spreads. Here we are showing uh, the spreads of AAA bonds and of uh, C bonds. We uh, see uh, sizable effects. We are we're doing this with Jordan projections. So the data on bond prices is daily. So we analyze kind of consecutive days uh, after a shock and we find um, substantial uh, effects uh, on uh, bond spreads, particularly of uh, low rated 
uh, firms, indicating that uh, a negative uh, shock in the net worth of uh, intermediaries is associated with an increase uh, in the spreads of bonds of non-financial firms, particularly when they have a high component uh, of uh, default risk. Okay, then um, we study um, the transmission uh, mechanism of these uh, type of shocks uh, through different uh, channels. Um, the first channel that we uh, try to consider is the effect that operates of these financial intermediaries th through the aggregate net worth uh, of the system. For example, several malls uh, along the lines that I was showing to you earlier, um, the reason why um, financial intermediaries have an effect on non-financial firms is precisely because of the aggregate net worth of intermediaries, and that is the variable that matters for uh, pricing uh, and for lending, uh, which is the transmission channel in that model. Okay, so what we do is to consider an interactive model uh, in which we interact the financial shock with the overall capitalization of the system. For this, we consider the aggregate net worth uh, and uh, a cyclical component of it. So we consider whether the effects are different for moments in which the financial system is well capitalized or in which the financial system is undercapitalized. Undercapitalized will be when the financial system net worth is below its trend. What we see here is that the effects are uh, driven uh, by moments in which the aggregate financial system is uh, undercapitalized. This, if you want, could be uh, consistent with the fact that a lot of the evidence that we have of why financial intermediaries matter for the economy come from moments of financial crisis, which is precisely when these financial intermediaries are distressed. And in many models, Gertrude Karadi, uh, Bruno Meyer Sanikov, in which uh, the variables that will matter for pricing is precisely the aggregate net worth of the system, these will be consistent with uh, such models, with uh, the state dependency of these financial shocks. We also analyze the uh, financing of non-financial firms as a part of the transmission mechanism. In the model that I showed to you, the only access to uh, uh, a fine external financing that these non-financial firms had was precisely from uh, the uh, financing from financial intermediaries. This is a salient feature, I would say, of most models of uh, financial intermediaries and their effects in the economy, uh, that uh, non-financial firms face some frictions that prevent them to uh, obtain frictionless uh, financing from households. So what we do to analyze the importance of these is to study um, interactive models, in which we analyze whether the impact of the uh, financial shocks on non-financial firms depends on uh, certain characteristics uh, that are associated with the firm that can be uh, measuring the degree of financial frictions that these uh, uh, financial firms have. So we, for example, we consider uh, leverage, credit ratings, and, uh, and the liquidity that these uh, non-financial firms have. What we find here, consistent with these models that I showed you, is that, for example, the effects of, non -financial, uh, of financial shocks on non-financial firms are larger for firms that have um, high default risk as measured by low credit ratings uh, or uh, for firms that have uh, low levels of liquidity holdings and that, for example, um, need to rely more on external finance to finance their investments. Okay, so you can uh, think about kind of the, these two key salient feature of uh, malls of financial intermediaries the aggregate net worth and the financing of uh, non-financial firms as a very important part of uh, our transmission uh, mechanism uh, as well, the transmission mechanism. Finally, some, so far, we have been thinking about um, the uh, effect of uh, financing uh, channels associated with these effects uh, of net worth. Now, an alternative channel that you can have in mind is that even if the, um, change in the net worth of intermediaries is driven by some idiosyncratic factor from these intermediaries, the omega in the model, you can think that that omega is revealing some information of the future productivity of uh, non-financial firms, and that is uh, changing uh, borrowers' desire to borrow their optimal production scale. Okay, so what we do is to extend um, the model to um, allow for such uh, effects uh, information effects on the borrower side. So here on the left panel, you have the uh, shock that I showed you before in which the omega shock has an effect of intermediaries. Well, if the omega now has an effect 
on the expected productivity of non-financial firm, then that will imply a shift in the demand of um, uh, non-financial firms uh, in terms of how much capital uh, they will uh, be willing to invest. Now, a key feature to try to identify these two channels in the data is that if you think about uh, information changing the desire of uh, non-financial firms to borrow, well, this will imply a decline of interest rate because it's precisely a shift in the demand curve, while as the um, financing channel from the lender side, if it's a shift in the supply curve, it will be associated with an increase in interest rate, in both cases uh, for a, a negative uh, effect, for a negative type of shock. Okay, so this tells us that in principle, if we want to identify these channels, we can uh, identify them by analyzing the behavior of um, uh, the uh, uh, spreads uh, of bonds that do not have substantial amount of, of default risk. Okay, so that's what we do uh, in um, the last part of the paper with uh, the composition of these uh, financing and, and borrowing information uh, channels uh, by using these sign restrictions that have been used in the monetary literature to identify the monetary effects and the information effects of monetary policy shocks. For example, the paper by Jarosinski and Karadi. Um, and if we decompose the effects into a lender channel and a borrowing channel, or, you know, the part that comes from the information from the borrower, uh, we find that our lender channel uh, delivers similar results to our baseline, um, indicating that uh, uh, the results are robust, the baseline results are robust, even if we extract from the baseline effects, the effect that is providing information from uh, borrowers. Here, we are uh, doing this with uh, highly rated bonds, so A and above, um, that do not have a large uh, component of the default risk. Uh, currently, we're working on an extension with all bonds and with the excess bond premium component of those bonds. All right, so to conclude, um, we have provided a causal evidence of the aggregate effects of financial intermediaries through a high frequency uh, base identification that exploits that earning announcements uh, uh, present a discontinuity in the information of uh, these financial intermediaries. And we've done so by using multiple type of strategies, event time analysis, heteroscale CCD base, uh, granular instrumental variable strategies, and they all deliver uh, similar conclusions. The evidence suggests important heterogeneous effects on firms. Um, these effects on firms, these heterogeneous effects on firms are different than those that have been analyzed, for example, in the monetary literature, uh, showing that it is important to have evidence that is specific to financial shocks precisely to study, for example, the heterogeneous responses of firms uh, to shocks. And we also show that there is an important role of the aggregate net worth of intermediaries and that nonlinearities in these models can present a, a, an empirical, a, a, an important element of the transmission uh, akin to what several models have suggested. Okay, now what we see that this can be used forward is that this can be used um, in empirical work directly as has been used, for example, in the monetary policy literature. If, you, for example, future researchers want to combine them with aggregate data, or what we see that, that it, uh, a promising area that we see that it can be used for this shock is that many times we have quantitative models of financial intermediaries and we want to analyze the effect uh, of, of financial uh, uh, intermediaries in the rest of the economy. Now, in all of these models, the effect of intermediaries in the economy is going to be governed by the degree of financial frictions. So what we're uh, suggesting is that our uh, regressions can be used as a moment that can inform uh, most models of financial intermediaries that we can write. And you can, in principle, run the same regressions in model simulated data with models of financial frictions uh, with these regressions that we're presenting. And in principle, use that to calibrate the degree of financial frictions that uh, uh, you can have in, in, in models of financial intermediaries. All right, thank you. Great, thank you very much, Pablo. A perfectly timed presentation. Thank you very much. And um, I'm very glad to see that uh, Marco Grotteria is uh, also with us now. So please, Marco, the screen is yours for uh, sure. 15 minutes for your discussion. Um, so is it full screen? Okay, so first of all, thank you so much, Michael, for inviting me to discuss this great paper. And thank you, Pablo. 
for the great presentation. So, I, I mean, I would start by saying that this is a central question in macro, and there is no doubt. We have been wondering for uh, right now, like a long time, on what do effect, what effects do financial intermediary has on like the macro economy, if they actually have an effect on themselves, or they are simply a sideshow for an amplification mechanism. Uh, you know, I think this paper makes really a step forward and greatly identifies the link between like this banking and non-banking sector. I think there is some work that still need to be done uh, between the financing versus information. This is something that, you know, it's very hard to disentangle because the two channels are intimately linked uh, and the financing change, like the collateral constraint, for instance, of banks change due to changing information. Um, and for that, I think that unfortunately, a more structural work is also like very helpful. But, you know, like definitely, I think this is a great step forward. And so, like, what I would say is that this paper has a novel approach. Um, this high frequency identification is actually like so cool, honestly, that you're using to answer like some very important macro question that people have wondered for a while uh, to try to estimate the causal effect. And so, like, my punchline is this is a paper that everybody should read. Because actually, this is, I think, how macro is progressing. Like, you know, even the paper by Diego Kranzik, who, like, I mean, he's a PhD student at LBS and is going to go to uh, the econ department or not Western. It sort of starts with this, with this approach, like high frequency shocks to identifying like the effect of news. In this case, in this case, it's about oil shocks and oil supply shocks. And then uh, he includes in a more macro environment like the AR and local projection methods in order to identify like the causal effects of oil supply onto like macroeconomic aggregates. And I think like this paper is doing a similar, using a similar approach, but uh, with a different question, which is what is the effect of this? financial constraints and equity capital. Now, uh, I would like, however, also to do like a helpful discussion beyond just saying how great is this paper. So I will, I will say like, there are some general questions that I have on the test uh, and then some exposition, more or less expositional comments. So the first question is identifying the effects of the shock is really hard. And you know, like in, in the paper, you say you have a placebo event, like a sorry, placebo test by using daily data, but I just downloaded from Bloomberg, like uh, data, daily data from 1998 to today, that you have the financial sector returns on the y-axis and the non-financial sector returns on the x-axis. Literally, this is just Bloomberg index, it's not even mine, it's S&P 500, whatever. Um, the correlation is very strong, like the R-square is 61%. And so then I moved a step forward. Like this is for the daily data. So I don't think like basically that placebo is really helping. Uh, to show like that frequency doesn't matter because you know in a daily frequency that's exactly why we're using in tick level that at the daily frequency there is too much information that aggregates now at the intra daily data however I also find similar results like this is literally what I did again from Bloomberg um, I use all the 30 minutes in trading hours that you can find this is these are the last three months Okay, Bloomberg only gives you three months of data. So, uh, or whatever, six months actually for 30 minutes. So this is for uh, November 2021 to today. And even here, you can see that there is a very strong correlation, regardless of whether or not there were earnings announcements or something else. Like definitely, again, this is as you said, because on one, I mean, the two must be correlated. This is in fact what our macro <laughs> models would suggest. So either for the financing reason or the information reason. Uh, and I talk completely agree with you that you go bone and suck methodology helps. And in fact, in general, we think there are these two solutions to the identification problem. On one hand, we have intraday tick level data. On the other hand, we have identification through heteroscedasticity. Problem when things are really using both. Now I have one question, which is actually a question for myself. How large is the incremental benefit to the heteroscedasticity identification once you have tick level data? Uh, this is more for me to learn in the sense like, I was listening to Eric Swanson and he was saying that for monetary policy, it, it's either one or the other, like you don't really need both. I think in this case, actually having both really helps, uh, but there is still uh, a, a, a small issue, which is heteroscedasticity based formulas could actually contaminate the estimates if non-earnings announcement of moscedasticity. In this case, I put the non-earnings announcement, uh, actually using earnings announcement uh, for like non-financial firms. But like if that assumption of homoscedasticity is violated. So, 
and you know you should you should actually check whether the homoscedacity assumption is violated or not. Um, now, I love that in the paper it's uh, like uh, all about idiosyncratic news, and I do believe, in fact, like the the great identification here would come like from idiosyncratic news about J.P. Morgan or Goldman Sachs. Uh, but I think, as some question were actually pointing in the chat, I had a similar reaction. Like you could actually think that the news might capture two components, one which is systematic and one which is idiosyncratic. And there is a very simple way to, to do it, which in finance we have been criticized for so long to do the, the, this type of uh, regression or analysis, but I think in this case it's very helpful. Why don't you run a regression on a market index or the financial industry index using daily data, for instance, for the last month? Then you're going to estimate a beta. Once you have the estimate of the beta, you can actually compute the residual. You can actually see how much that shock is unexplained relative to whatever market uh, the market movement is in that point in time. Or you can just take the difference. Okay, JP Morgan return versus the overall index. And then you're gonna compare, like you're gonna um, uh, compute the, the difference as you know, the idiosyncratic news specific to JP Morgan. Again, I think this is a robustness and addition of the results. It doesn't affect the main results. Uh, the other thing is, you know, like, you can actually look at macro aggregates, uh, similar to what Nakamura and Fanson did, uh, or what Diego did, like either you put in a VAR model or using local projection, uh, that again would sort of give more stronger, I mean, a stronger evidence on the fact that in fact you are capturing, I think, news about the macro economy, even though I, I think that, I mean, it, it's clear that that's what you are doing, but you know, it's good to see if it affects, you know, for instance, um, the change, if it affects changes in expected output growth from blue chips. That's, that's one idea. Now, I really like the placebo test on non-financial. It partially solved my question of what information is captured. I think that's very important. The only suggestion there is, you know, if you do with the top 20 firms by size rather than doing with the Dow Jones uh, firms, it's because at that point you are really capturing different uh, animals. Like on one hand, we have the top 18 largest banks. On the other hand, we have a lot of firms, including like small ones. You know, you can even check a broad index versus a specific sector. Now, these are actually all the expositional comments and I have six minutes, so I will, I will go relatively fast. The authors separate shifts in demand versus shifts in supply. And this is in fact great. I think that's how they should pitch it. And I really appreciate Pablo, Pablo did it for, for the last exercise. Um, in the paper, it's written slightly different. It's about in financing versus information. And the, the unfortunate thing is that information may also affect financing. Um, think about like all the models in which, you know, like uh, the collateral constraints of the bank depend on the future expected value of the economy and so on. Um, unfortunately, the two cannot be disentangled. And so it will really be, in that case, will really be a shift of both demand and supply. Um, and for instance, here I'm just saying, you know, could it just be that a better outlook means safer companies? So interest rates would also go down, which again would go to um, the supply channel as you presented in the slides. Or, you know, this already happens in frictionless model, but uh, I'm a student of Joao Gomez. So like the first thing I think about is equity issuance costs uh, and the fact that uh, companies may have a hard time to issue equity at some point in specific point in periods of business cycle. But also there could be the amount of credit rationing, which for instance changes over the business cycle. And this is in fact what it might be captured. Like what I say, information could really be a shift in the business cycle, uh, the way like macro people think about. Uh, the within firm variation analysis, I think, is actually one of the most interesting points of the paper. I, I was surprised you didn't speak in the slides. Uh, but th then there is still a, a point which I would like to, you to add, which is, you know, you have to consider that you are comparing bond of different liquidity. And so, like, one of the missing uh, regressors there is actually the BIDA spread, for instance, or how illiquid are the bonds. So, um, these bonds could, couldn't really be exactly the same. I mean, um, and the final thing is that from caution, we know that banks only hold 4% of total. It actually says corporate and bonds and foreign bonds. So at that point, however, it's very hard for me to think about how important should the holdings of the bonds really be, given that we know that it's only 4%. Okay. Um, 
So again, the last thing is just an expositional comment. I think like you should, like at the beginning, I was very surprised that you were working, uh, as I mentioned to you, uh, that that uh, you were working with book value, like sorry, with market value of equity rather than the book value of equity. All our models really speak about book value of equity and how it moves and how that affects like the loan supply of banks and so on. And the idea is that the present value of the future stream of cash flow discounted at the appropriate rate, this is in fact the market value. And so I was like a bit confused, but then like the two aren't really disconnected. And if we follow the, you know, like the, 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 the accounting rules and the general, you know, like gap, for instance, we know that it's required that all banks report cert certain portion of investment portfolio, the market value. So I was looking at the literature. I mean, this is an old paper. Uh, you, I am sure you will find like more recent papers. But you know, if you look, for instance, at large investment banks, about 33% are trading assets. And those trading assets are reported at market value. Okay, so there is market value accounting there. Um, trading assets for large bank, it's only like 12%. But again, there are other securities, for instance, available for sale. For available for sale securities, are, it's, it's a bit different. It's not exactly mark to market in the sense that, you know, I don't want to enter too much in detail, but like the realized gains and losses will, will go like in other comprehensive income and so on and so forth. But, you know, those are still partially mark to market. So effectively, there is no question that, you know, you are actually studying I think the only sectors where mark to market accounting for value really like implies shift in the book value. And that's why it's in fact important. I, I, I would stress it more. But anyway, so that's my discussion. All right, thank you very much, Marco. And so at the end you, or in the end you finished before your allocated time, so which means uh, more time for Pablo to maybe pick up and respond to, to any of the issues raised. Yeah, so thank you very much. Thanks so much, Marco, for a fantastic discussion. Um, these are all super constructive and insightful comments. So, you know, my main uh, response is just to thank you for bringing them and to say that we're planning to incorporate them into um, the next iteration uh, of the paper. I mean, all, all the exercises that you suggest are uh, make uh, make complete sense, um, and also you know the expositional comments and the interpretation for models. So I, th I think uh, we we agree with uh, uh, everything you said. So I so thanks a lot for for pointing them out, and and, and we look forward to incorporate them to the paper. Uh, with that, right. I think we're we're maybe good to to wrap up. Um, Thank you so much again for excellent comments. Uh, very useful. We are going to incorporate it in the next round. Well, thank you so much for letting me learn more about this topic. Thank you. Thank you. Yeah, and especially thank you from my side for contributing to this series. And uh, it was great to, to connect uh, with all of you. And um, I hope we can uh, continue to, uh, to run into each other in the future. For sure. Thanks again. Thank you very Thank you. much. Thank Have you. a good one. Bye-bye.